early one morning in 2014, just a few weeks before Jennifer Carver Hall's 17th birthday, she climbed into the driver's seat of her mother's gold Lincoln Navigator despite the fact that she was intoxicated. She'd reportedly been out all night drinking, but got back behind the wheel at about 6.30 a.m. when her cousin requested a ride to school. As Carver Hall traveled northward along Alexander Street in Plant City, Florida, she encountered a red traffic light. She proceeded into the intersection at a high rate of speed without her headlights on. Carver Hall barreled into a black Toyota Echo, which violently careened into a concrete divider. The impaired teen continued driving down the road, eventually coming to a stop after colliding with a pedestrian crossing sign. A bystander came upon the scene as the driver of the wrecked Toyota, identified as 52-year-old Keith Allen Davis, lay on the ground in critical condition. Carver Hall told the witness, I'm sorry, it was my fault. I just got my learner's permit. I don't have insurance. Davis was taken to Lakeland Regional Medical Center where he was pronounced dead. On the floor of Carver Hall's vehicle, officers found an empty can of four loco, an empty beer can, and an empty bottle of tequila. A few hours after the crash, the teen's BAC was measured to be 0.13. She later pleaded no contest to DUI manslaughter. After the case was brought to adult court, Throughout the legal proceedings, Carver Hall appeared remorseful, at one point stating, if there was a way I wouldn't hesitate to ask for God to take me instead. Judge Thomas Barber sentenced her to five years behind bars, followed by five years of probation. In October of 2019, Carver Hall was released back into society. Within two years, she was back in national headlines for yet another deadly drink drive incident. On April the 25th of 2021, the 24-year-old flouted her court-ordered curfew by being out of the house at about 1.40 a.m. She was drunk behind the wheel of her Hyundai Elantra, which she was driving down Interstate 4 in Hillsborough County. A highway patrol trooper spotted Carver Hall traveling at speeds of over 110 miles per hour and gave chase. As the trooper attempted to overtake the Elantra, Carver Hall abruptly veered to the right, sending the car down an embankment off the side of the shoulder. The vehicle became airborne, soaring over a fence before crash landing in the parking lot of a nearby car dealership. Carver Hall reportedly had three passengers in the Elantra, two of whom were ejected from the car. The trooper subsequently came upon one of the passengers, 20-year-old Lexia Gonzalez, crawling away from the crash site with a pair of broken legs. 19-year-old Grady Ramirez, who was in the front passenger seat at the time of the crash, suffered incapacitating injuries. The other ejected victim, 22-year-old Pedro Carvajal, was identified as Carvajal's cousin. All four of the Elantra's occupants were taken to Tampa General Hospital, while Carver Hall sustained only minor injuries. Her cousin ultimately succumbed to his. Her BAC was above the legal limit, and as a result, she was arrested on multiple charges, including DUI manslaughter. As of the latest updates, it was unclear whether Carver Hall's latest criminal case had been brought to trial. Number 5. Samuel Haskell IV In November of 2023, Los Angeles police arrested a 35-year-old man by the name of Samuel Haskell IV. The latter was the son of Sam Haskell, an Emmy-winning former executive at a prominent Hollywood talent agency. Haskell IV, described by the press as a director of low-budget slasher movies, was facing severe criminal charges upon being taken into custody. On November the 8th, the homeless man discovered a suspicious duffel bag inside of a dumpster in LA's Tarzana neighborhood the bag contained a female torso, which reportedly belonged to 35-year-old Mai Haskell, the wife of Samuel Haskell IV. The couple lived in the neighborhood with their three children, as well as Mai's parents, who had also gone missing. Fortunately, the Haskells' children were found safe and with the relatives. In the aftermath of the bombshell arrest, friends of Mai revealed that she'd repeatedly expressed a desire to divorce Haskell throughout their marriage. He abused her both verbally and physically, and allegedly treated her appearance disrespectfully, as he was said to have been angered by their presence in the house. Nevertheless, she continued to give him more chances because she was afraid that a divorce might trigger retaliation from him. The woman's friends grew suspicious on November the 8th after Haskell drove the children to school, a task which nearly always fell to Mai. The previous day, Haskell had hired four day laborers to dispose of three 
large trash bags. He told them that they were filled with rocks and Halloween props. However, one of the workers later spoke with NBC LA, telling reporters that the bags felt soft and soggy. When they realized that Haskell had lied to them, the laborers returned the bags and contacted the California Highway Patrol, setting the events into motion that would eventually lead to the man's arrest. As of the most recent updates on the case, the bodies of Mai's parents hadn't been found, but they were both presumed dead. In January of 2024, Haskell pleaded not guilty to three counts of murder, with special circumstances of committing multiple murders. Number 4. Prentice Bates One night in 2012, Las Vegas man Prentice Bates was heavily intoxicated behind the wheel of a rental car. Simultaneously, a man by the name of Jim Burchett was riding his motorcycle near Nellis Boulevard and Cheyenne Avenue in the East Valley. At some point, the impaired motorist collided with 58-year-old Burchett, killing him. The following year, Bates pleaded guilty to one count of felony DUI and was sentenced to between 8 and 20 years in state prison. He was granted parole in 2020 after serving only 8 years. Despite his serious DUI conviction, Bates continued driving after his release, reportedly because of a loophole in the DMV's database. As stated by a spokesman for the Nevada DMV, if a law enforcement agency doesn't take a license on the spot, no one in the larger community is going to know that it should be or is revoked. Consequently, two years after his release from prison, Bates got another DUI. He was released on bond on the conditions that he refrained from driving, as well as submit to alcohol and drug screenings. However, on September the 22nd of 2022, the 50-year-old got behind the wheel of his Jeep Cherokee while high on drugs. He started driving the wrong way along Rancho Drive, eventually crashing into a parked SUV belonging to 40-year-old DeMar Sims. The latter was a construction flagger employed by Road Safe Traffic Systems, who was working a construction site not far from where his SUV was parked, although the evening's construction work had already been completed. Sims was sitting in his car waiting for the work to be inspected at the time of the collision, which unfortunately led to his death. Upon arrival at the scene, police officers found Bates still inside his Jeep, allegedly bobbing his head to the radio. After failing sobriety tests, the man was once again taken into custody on a DUI, his third within the span of a decade. Bates pleaded guilty and in December of 2023, he was given a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 10 years. Number 3. Ramon Jimenez 30-year-old Missy Hernandez from Fresno, California, went missing in December of 2021. The mother of one had last been seen leaving an art exhibition in downtown Fresno on the 7th of the month. She was accompanied by her boyfriend, Ramon Jimenez, aged 41. Hernandez's friends contacted the Fresno County Sheriff's Office on December the 8th, requesting a welfare check at her residence. Jimenez was found inside the woman's home and deputies recognized him as having outstanding warrants for a previous domestic violence incident involving Hernandez. Despite persistent issues in their relationship, Jimenez was given a second chance and continued seeing Hernandez leading up to her disappearance. After being found by deputies, he was arrested on domestic violence charges. The following day, some of the missing woman's friends conducted a thorough inspection of her residence. They reportedly found evidence that she may be injured and told investigators that the circumstances of her disappearance were growing increasingly suspicious to them. Jimenez was officially named a person of interest, after which a judge decreed that he be held in custody on the domestic violence charges without bail. In the month that followed, detectives gathered enough forensic and digital evidence to conclusively identify Jimenez as the individual responsible for Hernandez's disappearance and presumed death. In mid-January, he was hit with murder charges and five days later, authorities discovered the victim's remains in the waters of the California aqueduct. As of the latest updates, Jimenez's criminal case hadn't been resolved. Today's topic was requested by Lokiism, 
iJazz Mailbox 7082 and I picked a lame name 9733. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Chance Mongean Early on December the 14th of 2023, first responders in Nashville, Tennessee, descended on the scene of a single vehicle accident along I-40 East. Convicted felon Chance Mongean, aged 43, had reportedly crashed his Audi Q5. Upon arrival, officers immediately found the man's behavior suspicious, as he was wearing a ski mask, had money falling out of his pockets, and was trying to retrieve items from the wrecked crossover SUV. When law enforcement approached, Mongean allegedly tried to flee but was swiftly caught. Inside the Audi, officers discovered a loaded handgun without a serial number, burglary tools, as well as a collection of illegal substances, three digital scales, and other drug paraphernalia. Mongean also had over $5,000 in cash on him. After his minor wounds were treated at the hospital, he was taken to the Metro Davidson County Detention Facility. It would later emerge that in May of that same year, Mongean had been arrested under similar circumstances. On the 29th of the month, the man got into an accident while riding a motorcycle on Interstate 40. He implored witnesses not to call the police before fleeing down the highway on foot. As he ran, Mongean discarded a loaded pistol, cash, marijuana, meth, heroin, cocaine, and pills from his pockets. After authorities caught up with him, they noticed that he appeared to be intoxicated and was carrying a phony out-of-state driver's license. He was booked into jail on various charges before being freed on a $71,000 bond. Following his latest arrest in December, Monjian was held in custody without bond pending further court proceedings. Stick around after number one if you have not yet seen our release about when parolees go wrong. That's lined up for you right after this. Number one, Nico Fanjul. At about 11.30 on January the 28th of 2024, police in Palm Beach, Florida were called to a local home after neighbors reported hearing a domestic disturbance. Upon arrival at the scene, law enforcement heard a woman shout, get off of me and subsequently found a man standing over a female subject. The unidentified woman was in the fetal position on the floor and appeared to be bleeding from her face. After separating the pair, officers learned that they'd been dating one another for about a year and a half. Earlier that evening, the couple had gone to Flagler Steakhouse at the upscale Breakers Hotel in Palm Beach. Per police records, the man, 38-year-old Nico Fangel, got upset because they were seated near a gay couple. After repeatedly voicing his disgust to his girlfriend during dinner, Fangel continued ranting and raving when they returned home. The woman eventually urged him to let it go, at which point he became violent, punching and kneeing her in the face. She cried for help as Fangel dragged her into the residence and squeezed her neck with both hands. While investigating the scene, police took note of strangulation marks on the victim's neck as well as blood on the floor. They arrested Fangel who had an envelope containing a white, powdery substance, believed to be cocaine, in his wallet. He faced charges of felony domestic battery for strangulation, false imprisonment, robbery, tampering with or harassing the victim, criminal mischief, and possession of cocaine. The man already had multiple runnings with the law in connection with past domestic violence incidents. As the heir to one of America's largest sugar production companies, Fanjul's most publicized arrest occurred while he was in a relationship with New York socialite and reality TV star Tinsley Mortimer. Following an altercation with Fanjul in 2013, Mortimer was hospitalized with head injuries. She later admitted to covering up the nature of their relationship for two years before finally ending her involvement with the man in 2016. Number 8. Ustachio Galis. While serving out a life sentence stemming from a murder conviction, Ustachio Galis, aged 51, was granted day parole. The conditional release meant that he was allowed to participate in public activities during the day as long as he returned to his halfway house nightly. Galis had grown close to 22 year old Marilyn Levesque, an escort who worked at an erotic massage parlor. On January the 22nd of 2020, the two met at a restaurant before checking into a hotel 
in Sainte Foy, a borough of Quebec City. It was there that Gilles reportedly stabbed Levesque a total of 30 times. He'd originally after carrying out the murder, but he instead decided on surrendering to the authorities. Levesque had reportedly grown distant from Gilles in the period leading up to her death. He'd thus become jealous and angry as a result of their deteriorating relationship and ultimately resorted to killing her. He was first charged with second-degree murder, but those charges were eventually upgraded to murder in the first degree. He was given a second life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years. The incident that led to his initial incarceration had taken place in 2004. Gilles repeatedly stabbed his ex-wife, Chantelle Deschamps, after striking her head with a hammer. His murderous rage had reportedly been triggered by her decision to leave him, and the violent attack had led to a life sentence with no chance of parole for 15 years. In November of 2021, a Quebec coroner ruled that the vest brutal death could have been avoided if Gilles had been ordered to wear an ankle monitor as part of his parole agreement. The coroner also recommended that equipping violent criminals with these monitors become standard procedure when they're released on parole. Number 7. James Dakota Branson and Annika Celeste Thorpe a 57-year-old Utah woman was found dead in her friend's driveway after being shot by two parolees during a random carjacking. The perpetrators, identified as 24-year-old James Dakota Brunson and Annika Celeste Thorpe, aged 23, had previously faced a slew of other charges that were mostly drug and theft-related. According to reports, the pair killed Linda Nemelka, a mother of five, on March the 11th of 2020 while attempting to steal her car. Due to the random nature of the crime, police struggled to identify any suspects during the ensuing investigation. It took more than a year for law enforcement to zero in on Brunson and Thorpe as the likely culprits. By then, both of them were already behind bars for completely unrelated offenses. Brunson had been arrested by narcotic detectives less than a day after killing Namelka, and Thorpe was back in custody on felony theft charges just five days after the shooting had taken place. Investigators found DNA on the murder weapon that matched both Brunson and Thorpe, and the two were subsequently charged with Namelka's murder. Number 6. Leland Guy Eagle Jr. A 36-year-old parolee was arrested for murdering his romantic partner after previously being convicted of other violent offenses. The body of Crystal Nelson, also aged 36, was discovered by the housekeeping staff at the Clarion Point Motel in Fresno, California. The victim had been fatally shot by a male acquaintance, later identified as Leland Guy Eagle Jr., who was out on parole for a past offense. The two were captured on surveillance cameras, entering the motel together several hours before her death. Police arrived at Eagle's paroled address after determining the former inmate to have been the perpetrator of Nelson's killing. He was taken into custody and booked into the Fresno County Jail. He faced multiple charges stemming from the murder and the associated parole violation. Number 5. Christine Shreve Hubs After being incarcerated for engaging in intimate activities with two teenagers, 44-year-old Christine Shreve Hubs of Livermore, California, was arrested again just five days after being released on parole. Hubs had pleaded no contest to the charges associated with her past crimes in 2011. She reportedly had improper contact with the two teenage victims from 2008 to 2010. She first pursued one of the boys when he was romantically involved with her teenage daughter. Hubs was accused of luring her victims by giving them cash, expensive presents, and special cell phones they used to secretly communicate with her. She was arrested after the mother of one of the victims discovered explicit photographs of Hubs on his phone. After being released from prison in February of 2013, Hubs found herself back behind bars less than a week later. State parole agents made a surprise compliance visit to her residence, during which they found adult content within her possession, which was a violation of her parole. Following her arrest, the two victims of her previous crimes were harassed on social media by Hubs's friends and family members. Livermore police subsequently investigated whether the threatening messages required any legal action to be taken against those involved. Number 4. Marco Quintanilla a 19-year-old woman was murdered during Halloween weekend 2021, and the resulting investigation led to the arrest of three individuals, including an active duty member of the United States Air Force. The victim of the violent crime was Lilani Beauchamp, who was last seen leaving a Halloween party in the early morning hours of October the 30th. She was accompanied by two airmen, identified as Juan Para Peralta, aged 20, and his roommate. 
Beauchamp's remains were later found by officers of the Fairfield Police Department in California on October the 31st. After a joint investigation by Fairfield Police and members of the Travis Air Force Base's Office of Special Investigations, it was established that Beauchamp had been murdered at Paraparalta's residence. The crime itself was carried out by a 27-year-old parolee named Marco Quintanilla and his sister, Jessica, aged 21. The authorities ultimately determined that Jessica had been the one to fatally shoot Beauchamp inside of Para Peralta's home, and Marco had subsequently tried to cover up the crime by hiding the body roughly 100 miles from the scene of the crime. Para Peralta was not charged in connection to the murder and had returned to the Travis Air Force Base as of November the 4th of 2021. Jessica Quintanilla was charged with the murder of Beauchamp, while Marco faced an accessory to murder charge in addition to a parole violation. Number 3. Obdulia Sanchez Obdulia Sanchez, aged 20, was arrested after fleeing from a traffic stop in Stockton, California, in October of 2019. Just a month prior to the incident, Sanchez had been released on parole after serving more than two years in prison on a gross vehicular manslaughter conviction. The event that led to her initial imprisonment had taken place on July the 21st of 2017. She had crashed her car while driving under the influence of alcohol. The accident took the life of Sanchez's sister and severely injured another passenger in the vehicle. Sanchez reportedly live-streamed the entire ordeal on Instagram, and the video recording was subsequently used by prosecutors in support of their case against her. The young woman's second arrest was precipitated by a brief police chase at approximately 1.30 a.m. The pursuit was prompted by Sanchez's refusal to pull over for an officer attempting to initiate a traffic stop. Sanchez eventually drove her car off the road near a highway ramp off Interstate 5. A male passenger fled the scene after the crash while Sanchez was taken into custody. Officers discovered a loaded gun inside the vehicle which led to Sanchez facing weapons charges in addition to the traffic-related offenses. Number 2. James Craig Dobson a man convicted of criminally negligent homicide in connection to the beating and fatal stabbing of a homeless man in Boulder, Colorado, was granted parole in July of 2021. Upon his release, 60-year-old James Craig Dobson violated the terms of his newfound freedom and subsequently took part in a burglary. After he failed to check in with his supervision officers, a warrant for Dobson's arrest was issued. He was ultimately found by members of Boulder law enforcement who were investigating reports of a theft of frozen foods from an outdoor freezer. The arresting officers noted that Dobson appeared to be under the influence of alcohol, an additional violation of his parole. In September of 2021, he was charged with second-degree burglary, theft, and violation of a restraining order. Dobson had previously been charged with second-degree murder after he was found guilty of inflicting the wounds that had taken the life of Ronald DeQuina in 2018. Dobson had reportedly assaulted DeQuina and left him lying in a pool of his own blood. Although he was ultimately spared of the murder charge, Dobson was convicted of criminally negligent homicide and sentenced to five years in prison. He was allowed out on parole after serving just three years of his term. Number 1. Brian Goldsby a 21-year-old student at Ohio State University was murdered by a man previously in prison for robbing and taking advantage of a pregnant woman. On February 8, 2017, Regan Tokes was leaving her job at a restaurant and bar called Bodega in downtown Columbus. The young woman was abducted by Brian Goldsby, a felon who'd been granted an early release from his six-year prison sentence in November of 2016. Goldsby forced Tokes to drive him to two different ATMs to withdraw cash. He subsequently abused her inside of the vehicle and then made the decision to murder her in order to conceal his crimes. He made Tokes drive to Scioto Grove Metro Park in Grove City. She was then ordered to remove all of her clothes and Goldsby walked her into the middle of a field at gunpoint. He fatally shot her, execution style in the back and side of the head. After the murder, Goldsby drove to his girlfriend's home and gave her Tokes' purse and wallet as a gift. He then dumped the murder weapon into a sewer and unsuccessfully tried to set Tokes' car on fire. To destroy any evidence of the crime, he was eventually tracked down by investigators and remanded into custody by a SWAT team. He was sentenced to life in prison in March of 2018. Thanks for watching. If you were offered a get out of jail free card that only covered for minor crimes, would you use it or abide by the law? Let us know in the comments section below.